O God, whose providence fails not, grant us by the intercession of thy blessed Mother that all evil may be removed, and thou wouldst give us everything we need for the future. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. What do cremation and the clergy have in common? I was pondering that this morning in my meditation, because both things come up in two of the main saints whom we honor today, but we honor most of all Our Lady, the Queen of all saints. This is her Saturday, which happens when there's a feast day only of a lesser rank that falls on a Saturday. And I think the answer to the question is that it all falls under the divine providence. The graces that we need to deal with, things that come up in modern life, the increasing problem of cremation amongst Catholics and the perennial difficulty in every age, but especially our own, for providing, providing providence, clergy, that all comes under God's grace, which is given us, of course, through Our Lady. The main saints on the calendar today come from poor Iran, Iran or Persia, they're not Arabians, you know, they're of a different blood, sent many martyr saints to Rome in the very early centuries. There they were Zoroastrians, they were sun worshippers. They received the grace of the faith, in this case two important men officials, um, Abdon and Senon were their names. They came to Rome providentially to take care of what? The burial of the bodies of the martyrs, because part of the Roman thing for the, the shame of it was that after a martyr had suffered all of his torture, was finally put to death, his body was thrown into the cloaca maxima, the big sewer, which was like sort of like an open toilet in Rome, for the final disgrace, you might say. Well, saints were inspired to practice the corporal work of mercy to bury the dead, and they would collect these bodies at night and bury them secretly, sometimes on their own properties, in case of today's saints, and sometimes they would, <coughs> of course, they would be taken out to the catacombs outside of Rome, the burial tunnels that the Jews had, first of all, and later on the Christians had, uh, outside of uh, the city of Rome. Our saints were caught doing this, and they refused. They were dragged to the idol of the sun, and they spat on it. And they were tortured, and they were finally put to death. What do you do with Catholics with this idea? Well, we can't, I had the case just a couple weeks ago. Well, we can't afford anything else. And so this is what the family has decided that they're going to do. And of course, also the family decides that we know of course, there'll be you no know, priest involved or mass, or usually if they can do it, they don't even let you know that somebody's dying. And they use poverty as the excuse. Because the problem is a modern commercialization of so many things in our life, and then it becomes out, out of reach, and it's all sort of all pagan worldly anyways. We've gotten so far away from the natural and the, and the Christian, and our Catholic customs in this, as in so many other areas. However, the answer always is the answer that the saints give. You face a problem, do what's right, Deus providea, God will provide. God provided in the past, Curie of ours would say that. God provided today, he'll provide tomorrow. He called his orphanage where to care of the children, la providence, providence. Just that, just, just that name, that was a providence. God provides with a little bit of maybe some networking and some research and Google something on the internet, pretty soon you can come up with an option that would be possible. But people aren't interested in those things. People are interested in giving excuses if they have to. They want the simplest and the easiest way because they don't want to practice the corporal work of mercy of the Christian burial of the dead. Now, that's cremation. The other is um, clergy. And I thought of that in, in connection with today's saying, He's from the 5th century, and he was a very great saint back then. He was a French bishop who also worked in England, in Britain. Um, and his name is St. Germanus of Auxerre. And he answers the question of, where do you get your clergy from? In the 5th century, there came this most, there were, there were a couple of curious customs 
the Catholics had developed, which later on fell, and they were not observed anymore, of course. One was delaying the baptism of children till they were older, sometimes till deathbed for adults, because of the idea of not wanting to do very serious years worth of penance for a mortal sin that was a bad custom. And the other custom was, was just an interesting one. They didn't have seminaries, and the apostolic age was, was over. The age of the martyrs had passed. Where are you going to get your priests and bishops from? So what they would do is they would pitch on a man who was probably of noble birth, but certainly a man who was well-educated and who had proven himself maybe in the army or maybe as um, a, a governor in some sense, public servant. And they would force him to be the bishop. And it would happen in church. That's how St. Ambrose became bishop of Milan. He wasn't even baptized yet because of the previous bad custom. Uh, another example is today's saint. He was, they say, not a very edifying man. He was, a, was a, a military man, and he was a civil governor at the end of the Roman Empire. And he um, liked hunting. He was sort of worldly. But he was a Christian nominally, so he was baptized at least. Well, this, the, uh, the, the bishop of the place whose name was St. Amator contacted the Roman authorities and said, I'm going to need a successor because I'm dying. Would it be all right with you if we ordained Germanus? And the civil authorities signed off on it, so that would be fine. But no one told him. So one day at Mass, he's just informed, you're going to be the next bishop. And then they, the crowd would take the man by force, as happened to St. Augustine too. They would take the man by force to the bishop, and he would cut his hair, and he would receive the tonsure, and they would force him to receive all of the orders. Isn't that curious? That's how it was done. I, I imagine sometimes there were problems with that system, you can imagine. But at the same time, it gave the church some great saints. He was like Thomas of Becket. He had a similar story centuries later in England. And Thomas of Becket told the King Henry, he said, don't make me a bishop, because if you do, you will be sorry. I'll take my job seriously, and I'll defend the church that you're attacking. Well, he did make him a bishop, and Thomas of Becket did defend the church, and he died as a martyr, and his brain spilt out on the um, pavement of Canterbury Cathedral at Christmas time one year. St. Germanus didn't die as a martyr, but he was a glorious bishop. And he, he, he like St. Ambrose, as soon as he was consecrated, he started fasting and praying, and he gave away his money to the poor. People lined up to see him with their needs, and worked miracles. And he always wore relics around his neck and his arms. And he would say, well, no, it's not me. It's the saints that I'm carrying with me. And the curie of ours did something similar, didn't he? They were sort of covered for his humility. And then eventually the Pope sent him to cross the channel to England to deal with the Pelagian heresy. Do you remember that? A few years ago, Bergoglio, when he first came in, he accused Catholics of being Pelagians, which actually is a misunderstanding of history and theology. The Pelagians taught you could be good without God's help. And you could do it on your own. It's total bootstrap, all naturalism. Just you can do everything. You don't need God's grace. You don't need God's help. Well, he, in a series of public debates, pointed out and proved that the, the, the wrongfulness, the wrongheadedness of that idea, that it was a heresy, and he vindicated Catholicism, and he reformed the church among the, the British, who were really sort of Celtic people, maybe like cousins to the Irish. Uh, but they weren't Irish, and that was probably the cause of some difficulty, because they took themselves a little bit too seriously. But St. Germanus did a lot of good for them. And when they were facing the first German invasion of the Angles, he uh, had this, this wonderful incident that occurred. Uh, he was, at, he uh, was with the army, and they were a small army. What were they going to do? Because the invading force was far, far larger. And, he's, and it was a mountainous region, he was towards Wales. And he told them, tell you what, we'll go into this mountain pass, and I want you all to stand, all of you soldiers, you stand ready, and I'll give you the word. And when I give you the word, you will all cry out, Alleluia, which of course is a Hebrew prayer, praise ye the Lord, it means vaguely in, in modern English. 
You cry that out. Well, they obeyed their bishop. Oh, that's a good thing to do. And when he gave the word, the word Alleluia, the prayer echoed. So much so that the barbarians who were invading thought there must have been thousands of men waiting for them on the other side of that mountain pass. And they, and they fled. They just gave up. And the battle was won without any blood being shed. One of the, the, uh, one of the many achievements of, of that saint. These saints, what are they examples of? They're examples of the divine providence. God takes care of us in every age. We don't need to offend Almighty God. We don't need to despise God's laws. God will provide. We don't know exactly how that's going to happen. And sometimes, like the Hebrews of old, we're tempted against God's laws. We're tempted to depend on ourselves like Pelagians, as though we didn't need to ask and to pray. Thank God, in modern times, God has given the church such a strong devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary that keeps people on the right track and gives us, especially to the rosary and devotion to her, gives us all of the things of which we stand in need. I'm saying the, the votive mass today of Our Lady, the Mother of Divine Providence, and has the Cana Gospel, where Our Lady notices the wines run out. She doesn't wait for anybody to ask. She notices it because she's a mother, and she just takes care of it then. She has a word with her son, and everything is taken care of. If we stay with Our Lady, even the things that we're too sometimes too dumb to notice and to ask for, or too stubborn, because you know how you don't want to ask for anything, you don't want to bother anybody. It doesn't matter. If we stay with Our Lady and with prayer, God's providence is at work in your life, in your spiritual life, but certainly in the life of the world and in the life of the church, whether it be cremation or whether it be providing good clergy for us today, for our sacramental and spiritual needs, God's providence does not fail, particularly when it's asked through Mary. Remember, I'll leave with this thought, remember Our Lady of uh, the Miraculous Medal in one of the apparitions to uh, St. Catherine uh, Loveray. She saw a vision, Our Lady is sitting there, but then she sees another vision of Our Lady in glory. And Our Lady has many rings on her fingers. Remember that story? She has all these rings on her. And um, not all of them gave out the rays of, of light and glory. It was, a, it was a magnificent sight. But some of the rings were dark. And others caught the light and, and were splendid to the sun. And she asks in her simplicity, this novice nun, our Blessed Mother, because she's, she's kneeling there with her hands in Mary's lap, what a beautiful position. And she says, Blessed Mother, why do some of the rings on your fingers not shine just now? And she says, oh, those are graces that nobody ever asked for. They would have been given, but nobody ever asked. We should ask for everything. We should ask with great confidence. We should ask perseveringly. And we must ask with Mary. If it's not for our good, don't worry. God will take care of that. He doesn't need us to plan our lives. He has, he has our life planned for us. But we do have to ask. We do have to pray. Thank God at the same time that there is a divine providence to the mother of divine providence that takes care of all those times when we don't see and we don't ask and we don't pray. For that reason, we should probably try to pray all the more. God bless you. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.